Today is April 8th, 2024. The conflict in Ukraine continues. Uh, the vector sum of this conflict continues to benefit Russia. The situation for Ukraine is deteriorating more rapidly. The West is becoming increasingly desperate. And as they become increasingly desperate, they become increasingly dangerous. And I want to talk about all of this, the state of uh, the fighting on the ground, the ammunition situation for Ukraine, this continuous use of the U.S. holding up $60 billion in aid as, as the reason why Ukraine is out of ammunition, uh, continuously clinging to that rather than face the reality that the ammunition simply does not exist in adequate quantities, and the different ways the West is trying to spin this conflict to continue motivating Ukraine to fight on, again, to the last Ukrainian, even as U.S. officials have openly publicly said, uh, when in reality, it's clear to more and more people that Ukraine has lost this conflict. Now, let's start by looking at the map. This is liveuamap.com. I've not done one of these updates in a while. The map has has actually changed. Uh, fighting continues along the line of contact. Red is Russian-held territory. Uh, we can see the line has remained relatively unchanged until we get to the Donbas region outside of Donetsk City, west of Evdivka. The last update, I do believe most of these towns here were still under Ukrainian control. And we, we heard Western analysts, Western commentators claim that Ukraine had stabilized the front. But in reality, Russia continued incrementally pushing forward, taking one town after the other. Now they are working on Birdici. It is inevitable that Russian forces will take Berdichi. And then, as you can see, there are no major settlements for quite a distance. Uh, what the Ukrainians are going to do uh, when they lose Berdichi and Russia decides to continue pushing forward remains to be seen. We see heavy fighting taking place further north around Stenbursk, uh, north of Soldar and Bakhmut. And we can see these uh, warplane icons. This is a pro-Ukrainian map admitting the increasing level of glide bombs being used by Russian military aviation. Uh, and we have articles like this relatively recently over the last week. This is from The Independent. Building destroyers, the Russian glide bombs changing the face of the war on Ukraine's eastern front. This is the Western media finally talking about a game-changing weapon, only it is a game-changing weapon in the possession of Russian forces, not, not Ukrainian forces. And uh, underneath this headline, it says, winged explosives weighing up to 1,500 kilograms. There's actually bombs even heavier than that. Nicknamed the building destroyer have had a devastating impact wherever they have been used, writes Tom Watling. Kiev is battling them as best as it can, but needs Western allies to step up and provide more weapons, air defenses, and ammunition, which simply don't exist. So Ukraine is not going to get them. Uh, Russia is not only going to continue using these bombs, but they will continue using them in greater and greater quantities. They have more warplanes coming online. They have more of these bombs coming online. We have seen a steady increase uh, from uh, not even hearing mention of these type of bombs to seeing uh, scores of these bombs being dropped on individual uh, battlefields along the front daily. We also have been seeing a lot of Russian long-range strikes, cruise missiles and drones uh, targeting Ukraine's energy infrastructure. We always hear about how this is a full-scale war launched by Russia against Ukraine. But in, in reality, Russia still has a lot of escalation it can still commit to. And targeting Ukraine's energy infrastructure is one of these areas uh, that it can work on toward what would actually be a full-scale war, a full-scale invasion. We can see the BBC reporting on this. Barrage of Russian attacks aims to cut Ukraine's lights. And it talks about how, indeed, these attacks are successfully uh, 
uh, disrupting Ukraine's energy grid. I remember in the opening days of this campaign, again, Western analysts and commentators were saying, look, they tried to knock out the Ukrainian energy grid and it's still online after one or two days of strikes. But Russia is doing this the same way they are doing absolutely everything else. They're taking a very systematic step-by-step -step approach to not only destroying these, these networks in a very specific way, but also preventing Ukraine from repairing them. Additional strikes are carried out to disrupt repairs. And this is how they're going about doing this. They're doing it in a very specific, deliberate, incremental way. And it is succeeding, even according to the Western media. Now, as we, we watch Ukrainian fighting capacity collapse gradually along the line of contact. And we continuously hear about Ukraine running out of weapons, running out of ammunition. I continuously hear analysts and commentators talking about how uh, the Czech and Estonian governments have found millions of rounds to give to Ukraine. So crisis averted, crisis not averted. I, I will explain how even under the most optimistic circumstances, this ammunition initiative is not is not going to save Ukraine, is not going to change the course of this fighting, not even in the slightest. We have this, let's begin with this Forbes article. Estonia just found another million shells for Ukraine. That's half the artillery ammunition Ukrainian gunners need for the rest of the year. Uh, is, is that what they need to maintain their artillery rate of fire, which is still less than Russia's rate of fire? Let's find out. Seven weeks after Czech defense policy chief announced his government had identified 800,000, later a million artillery shells that Ukraine's allies could buy for Ukraine. Estonian defense, the Estonian defense minister said his own government had found another million shells and rockets for Ukraine. You have to remember, this isn't a million 155 millimeter artillery shells. This is a million mixture of all different types of rounds calibers and even types of ordnance so some are artillery shells some are uh, rockets for multiple launch rocket systems just keep that in mind and they're all ammunition that has been in storage uh, for different periods of time some in some cases very long lengths of time the condition of this ammunition uh, will be in question and the amount that can be procured and moved to Ukraine at any particular time, that is also in, in question. They're trying to scrounge from the same countries that paid 1.3 billion for the Czech sourced ammunition and additional 2.2 billion to pay for the Estonian sourced ammo. If we combine these 1 million shells, the Czech's potential purchases, our buying capabilities, and also the British, who reportedly are organizing their own ammo for Ukraine initiative, I dare say that it would be possible to send Ukraine two to 2.5 million shells this year if the funding were available. With 2.5 million additional shells and rockets through the end of the year, the Ukrainians could match Russia's own ammo supply they claimed. It would be the first time in a year that the Ukrainians could fire as many shells and rockets as the Russians could fire. And remember, there was a period of time where Western analysts claimed that Ukraine was firing more artillery shells every single day. That was during the Ukrainian offensive last year, the spring, summer, fall offensive. And we can see how that turned out, how little difference that actually made. Forbes article also says, the shells include NATO standard 155 millimeter rounds, as well as Soviet standard 152 millimeter rounds, and also Grad rockets, implying that the Estonians are in part looking to countries in Eastern Europe and the Balkans. African countries might also be candidates. The Czech initiative reportedly sourced ammo from South Korea, South Africa, and Turkey. Again, what, what condition are these rounds in? How long have they been in storage? Even rounds that have been put in storage under relatively good conditions. Over time, they require refurbishment. So you cannot just take them and send them to Ukraine. You can, but there will be a high failure rate. It will become a danger to the crews and the, the weapons trying to fire them. That is one problem. They're, a mention, they're mentioning at least three different types of rounds, two different types of 
artillery shells, and they're talking about Grad rockets. They're talking about these rounds being taken from several different countries. We know that uh, 155 millimeter rounds, NATO standard, uh, certain manufacturers make rounds that only work in certain NATO weapons. And that, that, that was a, fa a surprising fact that we learned as the West was supplying ammunition to Ukraine. Even everything that is 155 millimeter, the rounds might not work quite as well or, or at all with certain weapons. When news like this comes out, however, people hear this 2 to 2.5 million and they just assume Ukraine's going to get 2.5 million artillery shells. They, they take the most optimistic possibility and that's what they run with and that, that's what they dovetail in with their analysis, which is almost always going to turn out wrong. And we have seen these analysts consistently get this wrong over and over and over again. There may be a million, two million, 2.5 million rounds of all types of ammunition laying around everywhere, or at least on paper, as these government officials go around the world asking what these different countries have. How much of it is in a condition that is suitable to send to Ukraine? How much of it can be sent at any given time? What is the timetable? When will the first rounds actually arrive in Ukraine in the first place? And I've seen in different articles, June, so that's still months from now that the, the very first rounds from this initiative might, might even start arriving in Ukraine. The best case scenario, as Forbes admits, is that temporarily Ukraine will be able to match Russia's rate of fire. To still have the, the problem of a deficiency in terms of artillery pieces, counter battery capabilities, they still have a manpower deficiency, they still have problems with their air defenses, a severe lack of interceptors for their air defense systems. They have no uh, significant air power to speak of as Russian air power capabilities continue to grow. I just showed you this article about glide bombs. The vector sum of the fighting, even under the most optimistic circumstances regarding this ammunition initiative, still favors Russia, decisively favors Russia. Uh, this is what else Forbes has to say about this initiative. Sensing the Ukrainians' ammo starvation, the Russians kept attacking west of Avdiivka, but the continuing assaults coincided with the launch of the Czech artillery initiative. Confident more shells were coming, Ukrainian gov gunners apparently dipped into their emergency ammo reserves and upped their rate of fire. The improvement has enabled Ukraine to prevent the loss of important defensive positions in the east. No, it has not. I just showed you the pro-Ukrainian map admitting that they've lost all of those positions west of Avdivka. I just That is a pro-Ukrainian map admitting that. Despite the initial excitement among Russian public and the Russian commander's intentions to penetrate deeper into Ukrainian defenses after the initial assault near Avdivka, the Russian forces ultimately failed to gain a significant, significant ground after seizing Avdivka. Again, untrue. We've watched how Russia conducts these military operations. There is no attempt for large territorial grabs. They have been working forward incrementally. The goal is not territory. This has been stated by the Russian Ministry of Defense itself. The goal is to grind down Ukraine's military capabilities. They will take territory in the process, but the primary objective is grinding down Ukraine's military capabilities. And clearly, even according to the Western media, that is exactly what's happening. Now, despite all of this very optimistic conjecture made by Forbes, they also very un uncharacteristically, I might add, douse some of the, the hope that might be emerging as people read the article. It says, if a small increase in Ukrainian artillery firepower could halt the Russian advance, it did not. Uh, but they're, they're asking if it could. Could a big increase reverse the advance? No, it cannot. Uh, remember, during the offensive last year, Western analysts claimed Ukraine had as many or more artillery rounds than Russia. The, the, the offensive decisively failed. Russia completely defeated Ukrainian offensive operations.
In other words, could a few million fresh shells help Ukraine turn the tide of the war? Obviously, the answer is no, but this is what Forbes says. To be sure, Kiev's forces have other problems. A manpower shortage, a dearth of air defense missiles, delays in repairing battle-damaged equipment. So, again, even Forbes is pointing out, even under the, the, the best circumstances regarding the ammunition initiative, there's all of these other problems working against Ukraine that there are no solutions to. And in reality, this ammunition initiative most likely is not going to get 2.5 million artillery rounds shipped to Ukraine in any timely manner and not in any uh, significantly useful condition. What else can we discern regarding the state of Ukraine's artillery capabilities. There's this article from the Wall Street Journal. Ukraine's Mad Max trawl swamps and minefields for shells. And they're, they're saying that Ukraine is so desperate for shells, they have people like this climbing through swamps, trying to find old Russian shells dumped as Russia retreated from, say, Kharkov uh, in 2022. It talks about him salvaging these rounds and, and mines, sometimes using the reusing the explosives for other types of weapons in a very ad hoc way. Uh, but what's interesting is some of the things that this article admits regarding Ukraine's artillery capabilities. It says, Paul Yukovich mostly finds 152 millimeter caliber shells, which work with Soviet era artillery guns. Ukraine is also increasing its production of 152 millimeter art ammunition, the officers said. But the brigade's Western artillery pieces take 155 millimeter shells, and the supply of such ammunition from abroad has dwindled. And again, you will see all of these articles tie it to the U.S. Congress obstructing the $60 billion in aid. But in reality, we know that the collective West simply cannot make artillery shells fast enough. The problem is we have three times more 155 caliber pieces than 152 caliber. Adding that the 155 millimeter shells were also more accurate. As a result, most of the brigade's guns are sitting idle. So getting back to this Czech and Estonian ammunition initiative. They're, they're talking about all of these rounds. They're not all going to be 155 millimeter rounds, especially the Estonian uh, part of the initiative. It's going to be 152 millimeter artillery rounds. But as even the Wall Street Journal admits, Ukraine has lost a lot of their Soviet era artillery pieces. They have more NATO standard pieces than they do Soviet era pieces. So what good is that 152 millimeter artillery ammunition going to do uh, if they don't have enough guns to make use of it broadly across the line of contact? And then there's another Forbes article talking about the state of these NATO standard artillery pieces, more specifically uh, M777s, which I've talked about in the past, how difficult they are to repair, how they were never designed for this type of conflict. And here's another article confirming that. This is, Ukraine could get millions of artillery shells and soon it's getting its best guns ready to fire away. And when you actually read the article, I, again, it's very questionable whether Ukraine is going to be getting millions of rounds. And then they talk about Ukraine getting these M777s ready, but they admit that that they're trying to make their own spare parts because they cannot get enough from the West and they can't afford to send the guns out of country to get repaired and sent back because it'll take forever. So they're trying to do it themselves, which is never a good idea with high precision weapons, as, as we've talked about many times before. This is what it says in this article. In 25 months of hard fighting, the Russians destroyed, mostly with drones and artillery counter battery, 44 of Ukraine's M triple sevens. They had 190 to start with. 44 have been destroyed, probably many more than that actually, and damaged another 38 of the guns. Again, probably many more than that. That has reduced by nearly half the number of M triple sevens on the front lines. Probably, again, much more than that. What Russia has destroyed and damaged is one thing. 
the guns that have just deteriorated and failed over time on their own because of the heavy use. That That is another uh, number that they're not even mentioning. And I'm, I'm sure that number is also very high. Again, they're talking about how Ukraine is going to be making their own spare parts. We've, we've heard these type of stories before. They're going to make their own spare parts. They're going to 3D print their own spare parts. And that's going to make up for the 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 failure to set up proper logistics. When you look into these stories more deeply, you see how fantastical that is, how unrealistic that is, how far from reality that actually is. The, the notion that they're going to be manufacturing their own ammunition on any sort of significant scale is also fantastical. Uh, they're probably doing all of these things, but on a scale that it, that makes it negligible. As Alex Christoforo of the Duran has pointed out, and I, I just read to you from the BBC regarding Russia's uh, destruction of Ukraine's power grid. They had all of these plans to turn Ukraine into a hub of Western arms manufacturing. If you have no power grid, how are you building and running factories? It just does not add up. It's all being said just to encourage Ukraine to continue fighting on when in fact they've already lost the war. That's that's what we're talking about. This is why they're creating these narratives to simply delay the inevitable, the, the collapse of Ukraine's fighting capacity. And we see how desperate the West has gotten. We've talked about this before. Uh, many other analysts, I just uh, reposted Mark Sloboda's comments on this on Telegram. Uh, this, is, this is actually from Last month, Macron warns Europe's security at stake after uproar over Ukraine ground troops comment. And he said it, he kind of backed off from it, but then he's been kind of building up towards uh, France and several other NATO members sending troops into Ukraine. And uh, we have Russia warning France not to, saying that those troops will not be spared. If they enter into Ukraine, they will be targeted alongside Ukrainian military targets. Then we have this from the Financial Times. This is also amazing. And another example of growing desperation in the West. Yellen warns China of significant consequences if its companies support Russia's war in Ukraine. And uh, she's yelling at China, threatening China about uh, sig significant consequences because the significant consequences that the U.S. was supposed to impose on Russia have not worked, and they're blaming China for this, and now they're threatening China with these, these same, again, significant consequences. This is what the article says. The U.S. has warned of significant consequences if China's companies uh, can provide support for Moscow's war against Ukraine, one of the sharpest messages it has yet delivered to Beijing. Following discussions in Guangzhou, the U.S. Treasury said Secretary Yellen emphasized that companies, including those in the People's Republic of China, must not provide material support for Russia's war against Ukraine and the significant consequences if they do so. Yellen's warnings come after Secretary of State Antony Blinken told EU and NATO foreign ministers that Beijing was assisting Moscow at a concerning scale and providing tools, inputs, and technical expertise according to the three people familiar with the discussions. Think about what the US is really saying to China. They're saying to China that Washington is allowed to interfere in Ukraine's internal political affairs, overthrow an elected government back in 2014, militarize Ukraine right on Russia's border, to menace Russia within its own borders, to eventually divide, destroy, overthrow the political order in Russia, all to eventually, ultimately, isolate China so they can use this whole same process on China itself. And they're, they're warning China, do not interfere with this process of isolating you on the global stage. We will take out Russia first. You will be isolated. Then we will do this to you next. And you better not do anything to stop us. That is actually what the United States is saying. I am certain that both Moscow and Beijing understand this, and this is why China has not, not advertised its support for Russia, but it most certainly is not going to cut its support for Russia either, whatever the nature of that support happens to be.
all of this posturing, all of these threats coming from the West, all of these attempts to uh, urge, say, China or India to assist the West in its failing proxy war against Russia, despite ultimately these countries being next in line if the U.S. succeeds in Ukraine against Russia, uh, is also accompanied by sobering admissions to just how bad things are going in Ukraine itself. And this is from the Washington Post, April 6, 2024, with no way out of a worsening war, Zelensky's options look bad or worse. This is a headline in the, in the Washington Post. This is the same newspaper that has, has been telling us over the last two years how bad everything has been going for Russia. And now suddenly this. Uh, which is no surprise to people who have actually been paying attention to what is really going on. This is what the Washington Post says. Ukrainian Western officials view Zelensky as largely stuck. A, from the United States, Ukraine's most important military backer has been stalled for months by Republicans in Congress. Previously approved modern fighter jets, the U.S. made F-16, are expected to enter combat later this year but in limited quantity, meaning they will not be a game changer. NATO countries are still exercising restraint in their assistance, evidenced by the recent uproar after French President Emmanuel Macron said European nations should not rule out setting troops. Is that, is that exercising restraint or is that just recognizing physical limits, uh, the impossibility of the West intervening and making anything better it's, as a matter of fact just imagine french troops along with the baltic nations and and maybe several other nations maybe even the united states they enter into the conflict they start suffering losses they're not able to break russian forces immediately they're incapable of long-term warfare at any significant scale you can see they're not even able to support ukraine as a proxy for any length of time, they themselves have a very limited window of opportunity to do anything in Ukraine if they were to intervene directly. If they were to fail, not only would they still lose in Ukraine, but the defeat would be even more devastating. That is the reality that they face right now. That is not exercising restraint. That is realizing how limited your options actually are. It continues, it says, Ukraine is reliant on its Western partners for weapons, but a $60 billion security, uh, $60 billion security package from the United States has been stalled in Congress for six months. Meanwhile, Ukraine's government is struggling to address its personnel shortages as measures to mobilize more soldiers have divided society. And the article also says, even if the aid is approved soon, the delay has sent a clear signal that future assistance is not guaranteed, especially with the U.S. presidential election this year. Officials also worry that Europe lacks the production capacity to compensate for a U.S. shortfall, especially in artillery and air defense ammunition, Ukraine's biggest needs. But as I've pointed out many times before, and as the Western media has even admitted albeit buried deep in their articles, the U.S. itself is incapable of producing enough artillery shells and air defense uh, munitions. The U.S. and Europe, they're, they're, they both have the same problem. If the $60 billion package had been passed several months ago, Ukraine would still be in the exact, exact same situation it is in right now. But it would just be all the more obvious to the world that it's not a matter of money or political divide in Washington. It's a matter of physical incapability to support Ukraine, regardless of the money spent. Then the Washington Post says, Ukrainian strikes deep into Russia, targeting military infrastructure and logistics, such as oil depots, have increased. But Kiev's forces are still under pressure along the front line and lately have been pushed backward. And that is because these strikes deep into Russian territory are symbolic. They are PR victories. They have no impact on Russia's oil industry, has no impact on the overall strategic posture of Russia itself. It's, it's in military operations in Ukraine especially. And uh, this is something that I was listening to in a recent video by Alexander Mikuris, also of the Duran. He was talking about uh, this article, actually, by Reuters. Exclusive U.S. sanctions hamper Russian efforts to repair refineries. You 
look through this article for actual evidence and all you see is references to sources who asked not to be named, uh, not a single person that was identified in this article, no evidence was presented. They simply suspect that Russia is going to have trouble repairing these refineries because they were receiving a lot of spare parts and technology from the West before the special military operation began. Isn't this the exact same narrative that we heard in regards to Russia's military industrial base? We were told that sanctions were going to cripple Russia's military industrial base. They would not be able to make precision guided weapons. They would no longer be able to manufacture new warplanes or any sort of sophisticated weapon system. Electro op optical systems would no longer be possible for Russia to manufacture. We remember very clearly the European Union chief Ursula von der Leyen literally saying that Russia's industry is in tatters. And yet, uh, as the conflict went on, we saw the Western media itself admit this. Russia overcomes sanctions to expand missile production, officials say. If you read that whole article, as I have many times before, it admits that not only has Russia overcome Western sanctions, but they're outproducing the collective West in terms of arms and ammunition. Does anyone actually believe that Russia would be able to achieve that in terms of its military industrial base, but not in terms of its energy industry, which is such an important component of the Russian economy. I don't think so. If Russia is having problems with its energy industry because of these drone attacks, no evidence has been provided yet by the Western media. Now, one piece of evidence we often hear cited that suggests that Russia is actually suffering in terms of its energy industry is this this ban on fuel exports. Articles like this from Al Jazeera, Russia orders halt on petrol exports. Coming amid attacks on refineries, ban is intended to avert shortages and spiking prices on the, the, the domestic market. But as Alexander Mikuris pointed out in his recent video, Russia has done this over the years when Market conditions allows Russia to export fuel. They will export an overabundance of fuel. And then domestically, prices will go up because supply goes down. And so the government intervenes. They ban exports to stabilize fuel prices. It's very simple. And if you look at this Al Jazeera article, it's amazing. Even in the, the, the beginning of the article, they admit a similar ban last year was introduced to avert shortages and spiking prices on the domestic market. And that was not because of drone strikes on Russian refineries. So this is Western analysts, Western commentators, the Western media, even Western governments trying to conflate these events uh, to put together a narrative that, that spins Ukraine's growing crisis in a positive light, saying at least they're achieving this in through attacks on Russian oil infrastructure, energy infrastructure. Uh, we heard a very similar narrative put together regarding the Black Sea. We continuously hear about Ukraine's victory in the Black Sea. Is it making any actual difference on the battlefield in terms of gaining back territory Ukraine claims is their own? The answer is no. And just to drive this point home further, there's this CNBC article from September 2023. Russia's indefinite ban on diesel exports threatens to aggravate a global shortage. And they weren't talking about drone strikes at all in this article. They were claiming Russia was doing this to weaponize global energy markets. But in reality, R Russia intervenes in terms of energy exports to stabilize prices at home. It's really that simple. This is where Ukraine and its Western sponsors are right now. They face a growing arms and ammunition shortage, a growing manpower shortage, neither of which there's any solution to. Even this Czech Estonian ammunition initiative even if it works out exactly as planned, it will only be a temporary fix. It will give Ukraine a temporary supply of ammunition. It will still suffer from all the other 
deficiencies that it has on the battlefield. Manpower shortage, air defense shortage, fewer drones than Russia is producing. It will also face growing Russian air power, and it will continue to lose territory along the line of contact. I continuously hear speculation regarding a Russian offensive, a major big arrow offensive. We've been hearing about this for years now. That, as I have said over and over again, I've heard nothing about this from the Russian military or government itself. They've not said anything about a major offensive. All I have heard them talk about is maintaining this, this strategy of constant pressure along the line of contact. Uh, maximum pressure, deteriorating Ukrainian military capabilities, collapsing Ukrainian fighting capacity, this prevents the necessity of having to launch a large arrow offensive into minefields, prepared defenses, other prepared defenses, uh, concentrations of artillery that would lead to large Russian losses, just as they led to large Ukrainian losses last year when Ukraine committed to a large scale attempted big arrow offensive that ended catastrophically. But we'll have to wait and see. I will continue keeping an eye on this conflict. I will get back to doing regular weekly updates on the situation in Ukraine. If you thought this video was useful, please like and share. Check the video description below for other places you can find and follow my work. I do com comment on this conflict almost daily on Telegram and also X. The links to those accounts will be in the video description below. Check the video description for all of the links that I referenced in this video, as well as for ways you can help support my work. I do not monetize any of my social media platforms, including YouTube. If ads pop up, feel free to skip them. If you do want to support my work, please do so through Buy Me A Coffee and also through Patreon. To everyone who has been helping out, whether it's a one-time donation, donations month to month, or if you have no money to spare and you're just helping share my work with others, that is all greatly appreciated. That is what makes this work possible. So thank you. And as always, thank you for watching.